This is Dr. Richard Barwell uh, with the uh, Neurologically Based Chiropractic Brain Trust Group. This is uh, interview number three. I'm excited about this interview. Um, this is a very special person, a person who has never stopped learning, and she continually impresses me with the next step that she's taking. It's Dr. Laura Hansen. Dr. Laura, um, welcome to the Brain Trust Sessions. Thank you. It's great to be here. So we're going to cover some ground fairly quickly. We've got about 30 minutes. We're going to go through this. Uh, let's just start out with um, who you are, your educational background, and how many years in practice. Uh, where did this all start? Well, I've been a chiropractor for 22 years now, and I think I'm actually going on my 23rd year. And um, for me, it really started with children. Uh, very quickly out of practice, I just kind of noticed that kids would come to me, and unfortunately, we don't get a ton of pediatrics in school, so I really wanted to go and learn. And I entered into the ICA Pediatric Diplomate Program uh, February of 1997, and that took me three years to complete that. And then they asked me to teach neurology, and I think that was the real kick out of the nest for me. And in order for me to really feel like I was doing a good job, I had been searching. And like you said, I, I really am a life learner. I uh, entered into a program through the Institute of Neuro, uh, Psycho, uh, Institute of Neurophysiological Psychiatry, and I became a neurodevelopmental therapist. And my world changed because I really understood how this nervous system gets wired up while really even before uh, we conceive a baby, the influence is just phenomenal. And then um, because of that program, they work on the reflex system. And so the Moro reflex just became the end all for me. And when I was trying to describe it to parents with the child making these grand motions with their arms and legs or easily startled, I got it but the parent really didn't get it. And then my next step in the journey was, was meeting you, Richard. I finally sat down and listened about the neuroinfinity. I had a student that was constantly telling me, go listen to this, go listen to this. And I, and I did, and as soon as I did, I made a lunch appointment with you. I drove down to the airport and I was like, I want what you have because it'll quantify the stress response and that's what's at the heart of a Moro reflex. And um, so that in 2008 is really when I began uh, working in neurofeedback. And then just recently, and I've got to put this in there because I'm so proud of myself, I just completed my master's in sports health science. I passed my test. And now I have that for the nutritional component. And I have one step left to get my BCI certification in neurofeedback. I just have to take a test. And I've been studying because you cannot believe the material that they expect you to know for that test. But I'm excited because every time I learn something, it just has a tendency to take me so far. So that's my background. Like I said, uh, this, <laughs> this lady never stops learning. Incredible. Congratulations, Laura. I know you've worked very hard, and I know it hasn't been easy because, as we'll probably cover, there's been some major things going on in your life during this time period yes. that were absolutely, you know, you know, everything was in place for what happened during that time. So uh, yes, we'll absolutely. get to that just okay. in, in a minute. Uh, th this is incredible. I know that I was looking for a person that knew about primitive reflexes because at that stage where we cannot use the neuroinfinity to take a look at what's going on with the brain, we needed to have somebody for primitive reflexes. And so it was, uh, it was destined that the two of us should get together. And I, I'm so tickled that you're a part of this group. It's just, I want to say thank you very much for all the effort you put into this. So here's the thing. You went to chiropractic college. Yes. You learned the traditional approach in chiropractic. Um, what model was that based on? Uh, the short leg and a bone on a nerve and the garden hose theory and um you know you could pretty much eat concrete as long as you got adjusted everything would be all right 
<laughs> Do you ever have any questions about that? <laughs> oh, I think uh, all the time. And I think it's really what has propelled me because working with these kids with developmental delay, you know, if all it took was a chiropractic adjustment, I believe I would have the Pulitzer Prize by now. And that's just not true. You know, that's, and that's just what happens to most of the people that are graduating. We all have those silent questions. We, we wonder about it because we're never given that support uh, of research or that supports that bone on nerve theory. And yet we're, that's what we're given to practice with. So most of us end up turning to some sort of uh, practice management or regimented technique approach to try to uh, sort of enlarge that or at least to give us some more security. Did you ever get involved in any of those? Well, actually, I did. Um, I actually early on looked at a practice management group that was going to make an MDDC type of practice. And after just because uh, I was very young, this was within like the first year of getting out of school. Um, I looked at it and even things got started and then all of a sudden it was the the time frame where a lot of these places started to go down and I just quickly got myself out of it because you know I didn't want that to happen to me. Um, the other thing that that really was hard to have in the background was there was a season that I actually really needed work and found myself working in offices that on the, when you meet them and have their interviews, you, you really think you're getting involved in something that's wonderful. And once you're in there, it's, they're like PI mills. And the things that they were doing was just despicable. So, yes, I've also seen the darker side of this. I have. You know, it's interesting. We were talking with Dr. Rich Applin yesterday, and he was talking about the linear approach of medicine and the nonlinear approach that really is chiropractic because of uh, we influence brain function and, and energy and organization. Uh, and it was really an interesting discussion. And that's exactly was my experience as well. I ended up with practicing with some MDs and the two don't match. Right. My, it was like speaking a different language to these guys. And it was mm -hmm. like, I realized very shortly that this was not the place I, I wanted to be and it was not going to help chiropractic at all. So, uh, boy, that, you learn that lesson very quickly that they don't have the answers that they appear to have. Right. So, let's see, have you ever used any instruments in practice? Um, I've used an activator, but not really using the activator protocol. Um, but that's, that's oh, and SOT blocks, I've used that. It's not really an instrument, though, is it? Um, but really just an activator, okay. other than my hands. And I'm what about, my hands on adjuster. What about things like x-ray or, or the um, my, um, myovision or, or the substation, anything like that along the way? Well, I used x-ray when I first got out of school. And literally, I set up exactly the way you were trained in school to set up your office. And um, had my x-ray and literally started you know looking at the body and then found out about the 3d image versus the 2d image of x-ray and i just let it go because we weren't really getting the the real picture um what you say that what would you say was the biggest challenge from especially starting in practice the biggest challenge was going to work for somebody that other people knew but they didn't know his real character. And so the very first practice that I went to was an awful story where this individual um, made it out that he was looking for somebody to come in to a small town, take over this practice that he had purchased. And so I'm going up to the highest northern component of the United States and bringing my son along with me and we get up there and it is nothing of what this individual has said that it's going to be and it was it was such um, it was it was such a facade uh, one, one of the things that happened, not to go so deep into that story, but he was acting like he was taking x-rays of everyone and literally had an old-fashioned dip tank. And one day he just left 
and there were no x-rays in the sleeves. And I found out that he owed like hundreds of thousands of dollars to people. And then two weeks later, the lady that actually owned the house and the practice called me up, said, I heard you're a really nice lady. I'm letting you know um, the house is going to be foreclosed on because he's never made one payment and mm -hmm. I'm getting my house back. <laughs> the next thing you know, my son and I are like, oh my gosh, where are we going? What are we doing? So I, I, think, it's, I think it's this ethicalness is, has been um, a real eye-opener for me. Over well, that's, that's not an uncommon story. We hear especially a lot with the new graduates, which mm -hmm. we really need to put the new graduates on, on notice to say, listen, before you leap into anything, you make sure of what's going on up there. I, I, I know we have a, a current situation with, with one of our clients who is a dedicated young chiropractor and, and walked into a situation that when we thought it was one thing, it turned out to be something else. Yes, about something like uh, with when once you're in practice, things like uh, new, getting new patients or retention or compliance or <laughs> bottom line making income. Was there yeah. ever a challenge that, that you saw at first? Well, at at first things were going through that transition I was just describing, and then um, initially that really that situation turned out very favorable. And it was also at a time when insurance reimbursed and there were a few years that the practice just grew. I bought my own building and really it was a time of my life that I had more money than I've ever had. And then I had to, I had to balance life and family and it really wasn't the best place for my son because it just really wasn't anything for him. And so we moved and once we made that move, um, it's never been the same since. And I don't know that it would have stayed being so prosperous because everything about insurance has changed to where yes. now I, I, don't, I, don't do, I don't accept insurance. I'll be happy to give you a super bill, but I literally almost left being a chiropractor uh, because I was involved in the whole insurance game. And as that depleted over time, and I was giving my heart and soul and working long hours and really putting everything into every patient and then not having enough money. Um, and that, that's been unfortunately a continued thread for lots of us, you know, and I just, I find it very unfortunate. And then you tie in your student loans and it, it's, it's really a problem. Well, this is, this is the story of what's going on today. I don't know if you've been reading my articles, but that's exactly what, what I've been trying to address is the fact that students uh, are graduating with such huge debt that it's very, very difficult for them to get started in practice. Mm -hmm. And so the only thing they can do is to go in with someone, and if their, their belief system in chiropractic is not the same as the person they're going in with, they either sell their soul or they run into a problem that makes chiropractic such a challenge that they drop out. Mm -hmm. Let me just move down to the concepts of neurologically based chiropractic because mm -hmm. that's that's the transition that's going on. That's what's happening worldwide, not just with chiropractic, but all the health fields that's are cool. looking at neurological now as the foundation. And we have a great session going on with, with chiropractic. I know that um, I started this concept 20 years ago of neurologically based chiropractic rather than structural based chiropractic. That's the difference. Um, when we sat down and had our talk, our luncheon, and we started talking about this, I, I can see the twinkle in your eye and, and your excitement going like, this is what we've been talking about. Uh, what, is, what happened to you after that discussion? Well, I, I can say it now. I don't know that I would have put these words to that back in 2007 or 8, but I, I like to quantify what's going on with a patient because then I can repeat it and show the progress. So it has changed my approach to patients, especially learning the concept of under-aroused and over-aroused, which really focuses very nicely with the reflex system. 
I really do like the reflex system, and it's not just about pediatrics, but if an adult has a stroke or a heart attack or some very significant emotional event, this is where you go back to. So to be able to quantify the stress response and be able to explain that to a patient using graphs and numbers, then they get it. They're now involved. They're able to see the differences. Um, the practice now, my practice now is more on the neurofeedback side than anything else because the results are so quick. We lost you now. And last, you are building strategy. Results so are what, what I said was the results are permanent. And you are really building strategies of awareness inside the brain of a patient for them to be able. It doesn't mean that you won't go through things again, but you're literally able to go, okay, remember why you came in here? And let's go ahead and bring that back up. Now you've had maybe 10 or 12 sessions and let's get those brain waves fired up a little bit. Now go and control yourself. Go back and get everything back where it needs to be. So they can literally see, I can have a situation going on, I can see the impact on my brain, and then I can bring my brain back into a healthy state. I mean, that's where I can get to with patients now, and then I can introduce them to chiropractic, um, most of these people are definitely over aroused, so they would only be getting adjusted once a week anyway. Uh, but it has really changed my ability to make phenomenal changes with the neurology that's going on in a patient. And I just can't encourage people enough to take a look at this. Uh, you know, we have so many chiropractors out there that are are thinking that they're doing neurology stuff. Um, some of them are taking advanced programs, you know, like uh, IAFNR and the Carrick program, putting a lot of time, effort, and money into it, uh, learning a great deal. Um, but still, uh, what do you think about these people and the using of the neuroinfinity? Would they be would it be beneficial for them to be using it? Absolutely, because I understand using smells and tuning forks and glasses and movements, but you're, you're still not exercising the brain. You have to get the brain into this equation so that the brain can learn a new pathway. So it's fine to go and do all of that stuff, but you still need to have this concentrated period of time where the conscious brain gets out of the way and the subconscious brain comes in and says, okay, let's put all this together. Do I really have control of the brain wave that I am trying to do better with? Rather it be beta, theta, alpha, down-regulating delta, up-regulating, excuse me, up upregulating delta, like in a Parkinsonian tremor. They do great if you bring delta up. So it, it's not that you can't utilize the information that you're learning in the advanced neurological programs, but I would really encourage you, open your mind and realize that there's a really big picture. When the brain is able to just allow itself to take over on that screen, the changes that you're making are phenomenal. The uh, practice that you have, I know, is pediatric, uh, has a huge pediatric strength. Um, how is this working with, with kids, with the, the neuroinfinity and the biofeedback and the neurofeedback with the, with the children? Because I know you've been dealing with some pretty damaged kids. They're unbelievable. You know, the first thing I have to do is, is I do an assessment, and I will always include the brain mappings and stress response tests if I can keep them in a chair, as long as I can keep them in a chair. <laughs> but if these kids are not in their bodies, I always get them in their bodies and then go seal the deal with neurofeedback. But there's a lot of kids that can absolutely do this work while they're doing body work at the same time. 
And what's so fun of what I've learned over the years of working with them. So let's take the sailboats, for example. All I have to do with a kid with the sailboat is say, figure out how to move the green boat. Where the adult, you have to kind of go through, here's the top, bottom, our inhibitory, the middle is a reward, I want you to focus on the war, da, da 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 The kids, you just tell them, go figure out how to move the green boat. Because they have grown up in an era of learning how to figure out video games. And so they're mu it's much easier for them to look at the screen and figure out what to do. And then we can make those kinds of connections for them about what it is that they're doing. So I, absolutely kids can do this. What about the uh, history? And I just want to make sure we get this in. And I know that uh, this is, it's a wonderful story to begin with. It's a terrible story to start with. And you know where I'm going with this? It's with your I daughter. So. Uh, yeah. We were all just yeah. in agony. And I cannot imagine your feelings and your uh, emotions going through the terrible time. But what we see in the end result is phenomenal. So let's just quickly talk about what happened there. Well, my daughter was uh, T-boned on May 11th, 2016. On the Glasgow Coma Scale, the paramedics gave her an eight, which means about in the middle, because that scale goes from three to 15. 15 is a mild traumatic brain injury, and three, you're dead. So she got an eight, her hands and feet were curled in, by the time she got to the hospital, she was a four, she was dying. She had three brain bleeds and multiple areas of lesion. Uh, she was in a coma, not induced for 12 days. She had to relearn how to walk, talk, eat, toilet, dress herself, everything. And um, she did. And she has worked so hard. She is a completely different human being than prior to saying goodbye to her on May 11th. But I do believe she is exactly who she needs to be in God's eyes because I believe she had a conversation with God. It was a, a really hard time because in the beginning, nobody knew if she was going to live. And then it went to prepare for long-term care. And I remember one day crying on her bed going, wonder if she never comes home. And it, it was just an amazing journey. And once the rehab started, I was able to start doing things myself. I even snuck things in there once her uh, life support tube got out of her mouth and she had a tracheotomy. But um, I, I worked with her. In, in addition to what, what rehab they, they were doing, I brought my equipment with me. And I have literally documented the first half of this journey. And I didn't stop. I have to tell you, Richard, I believe everything I know was to prepare me for May 11th. Uh, my daughter is doing phenomenal. She does have some hearing loss and some short-term memory, but it is not holding her back. She at the University of Georgia. She just finished her first semester and she made the dean's list. <laughs> wow, my goodness. She is a remarkable, remarkable person. I just love seeing her. She, she's just incredible. Uh, here's the thing. When, when she was in trouble, you were using chiropractic, you were using essential oils, you were using neurological training, you were using everything, primitive reflex, everything that you had learned, you were using, which was out of the ordinary for this particular situation. How did the people react at the hospital? Well, I think I can summarize it in one line. At Children's Healthcare of Atlanta, the uh, PA wanted to have me hired. And she literally went to the hospital and said, we, we need this lady to come and work with us. And what was so upsetting, and it, it, I know it breaks all of our hearts, it, it, because I'm a chiropractor, they wouldn't even entertain it. Wow. Isn't that, that's just... Uh. It's too frustrating for me to even go there. We're, 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 on a, we're on a mission to, Carly and I are actually going to be on TV uh, January 30th on Atlanta at Live, and we get to give our testimony of our journey. 
And our goal is to really help those with brain injury because we met so many people that had had brain injuries uh, during this time. And it was so sad to think that they, they feel like it's a dead end. Even her neurologist who released her last fall, when we called to get whatever we may need for whatever reason, his PA says to me, how did you know to go and do all of this stuff? Can you give me some resources? Because we feel like we don't have any resources once they get released to continue to try to help them. Even though their model will tell you it's a two year healing process. Well, then something has to be in place for two years, you know? So we hope to bring light about what we do and why we did what we did. And also hope that regardless of the circumstance, we have a phenomenal thing up here in this brain with neuroplasticity. And if you give it the right stimulation, the changes are great. Just sort of to end with this, I want to, uh, to have your view on this, this question. What would you suggest, not only to new students um, and chiropractic, but to graduates, to people that have been in practice for a while that are, are struggling to have the same questions that you and I have had all the way through, um, but are stuck in the model? Uh, we have neurologically based chiropractic available out there. We have the neuro infinity. Uh, what's your suggestion for these people? Number one, get a stress response evaluation because you are locked in stress and you're paralyzed. You can't move. If you know that something isn't going the way that you really want it to go, you're stuck. If you can't move forward, you're stuck. So this is why we have what we have. Find out what's going on in your own brain, and I think the rest of the doors will open. I think every one of us that have become chiropractors, we did this with this innateness that we want to help other people. We, we may have had something in our own personal uh, development or something that may have happened to us in life that wasn't taking us to our fullest potential. Now is the time to make a change. Don't be scared look into it, come and just experience a weekend so that you can understand what's really behind the software and what tools this will give you and it will change your practice. It will open it up and make it very exciting. You will find a new passion for what you're doing. You know, that's the strong message for everybody that's out there. Um, chiropractic is moving forward. We're becoming part of the uh, 21st century. Thank goodness um, it's available for people. So I want to take this time to say thank you, Dr. Laura. We will come back and visit you again because I know that we have only touched a very small part of that brain of yours and what you, your wonderful experiences. I am so, so pleased and proud to have you as part of this team and, and uh, humbled by your commitment to to us and it's just it's wonderful so so i will be seeing you somewhere down the road and we'll keep on the journey okay love you love you too